Okay, why don't we get rolling? Um, wow, I, I can't tell you how impressed I am that uh, so many people have returned. That, I mean, it was a pretty heavy list, lift yesterday, and everyone was really, you know, your minds were like just popping all day long, and I thought, oh, they're going to be so exhausted, they won't be back tomorrow, but wow, how impressive. So, um, and the Admiral and I were just talking about, um, you know, as we just wandered around yesterday, just it was nonstop, uh, you know, uh, people communicating, talking, great ideas, and just, you know, a lot of, yeah, very high energy levels. So thank you all. I mean, we were also just saying, you know, we did sort of handpick you all to be high energy, knowledgeable leaders, and that was pretty obvious um, throughout the day yesterday, so thanks. And so today we're going to have an equally exciting day. Um, you know, yesterday we heard new terms like evil fishing. Um, I <laughs> I heard the breakouts were really raucous um, and um, a lot of great recommendations, you know, whether it's data sharing and coordination or communication and innovative ideas. And I know we'll, we'll hear a lot of that uh, as well today. Um, excuse me. And I just want to, um, before we turn it over to our, our great kickoff speaker, the ambassador, I want to remind folks that um, there's some, you know, if you need help, we have a, a, just a stellar team here at Stimson who is, you know, has the yellow, uh, that's Emma Myers, I don't know, Emma's out back, <laughs> Amanda, Amanda's out back, um, Ben, who's right here, um, Claire, who's next to Ben, and Adele, who is uh, uh, behind me, um, the, the, who's filming, and Christy from, you know, who is also, Christy Olkin from Vimeo, who was just tremendous, our partner, as, as we were pulling all this together, and April, who stepped in at the last minute when Lori, retired and has done. So this is the team that has just been tremendous. So thank them throughout the day. Um, uh, and we'll tell the women out back that they just got a great round of applause. <laughs> um, so with that, I'd like to um, start off by really turning it over to um, Ambassador Makaya. And I mean, amazing. You came and spent most of yesterday and are spending all day today, and I, you know, I think that just speaks volumes for your commitment, and when you look at your background, it's not surprising. I mean, you know, Ambassador Makaya is, um, he is a chemist and a biochemist and really interested in environmental issues and science, and, and um, you know, has worked for many years both in Costa Rica and in the United States in that, in the ag business, and um, really, he has led research and development teams um, in biotechnology and biomedical research and health sector. So really gets the connection and the linkages between the environmental health and the importance of environmental health as well as the importance of the environment, tourism and other things in Costa Rica. And it's just been a, a real leader in Costa Rica. So I'm, I'm you know, businessman, advocate, scientist. Who could be better um, to be here today with us and to represent Costa Rica? So thank you. Thank you, Sally, for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you this morning, um, such a distinguished crowd. Um, this is uh, a very relevant meeting uh, because we are truly at an inflection point in our, in our global situation. Um, but I'd like to start out by thanking the Stimson Center for putting together this this, uh, organizing this event. It's, uh, it's truly timely. And what we've been talking about is lawlessness at sea. And lawlessness at sea um, is due to a, a weak presence of the state at sea. And that allows criminal, criminal networks to thrive. IUU fishing and security are intimately intertwined, causing great social and economic damage and unfortunately, Costa Rica is not the exception. Costa Rica's geographic position makes our exclusive economic zone in the Pacific the preferred route for drug traffickers, transporting cocaine from South America to North America. The corrosive drug money can then start to entice potential collaborators along the way. For example, Traffickers uh, have fast boats 
and those fast boats depend on refueling by uh, boats that operate under the guise of legitimate fishing vessels. However, these collaborators are paid in kind, that is, with drugs, not with cash. And so they themselves become drug traffickers because they return to port and they have to monetize their payment. And this creates more uh, presence of drugs on our streets, increasing drug-related violence. And we can see the, the downward spiral this has in our society. Another sad example of the interplay between narcotics trade and IUU was the recent catch last year of 492 kilograms of cocaine stuffed within sharks that were picked up. And this was not a unique uh, example. So there is definitely this interplay between IUU and security. The relative poverty of our coastal regions, which was mentioned by Jorge Jimenez yesterday, is part of the problem. This poverty makes us more vulnerable to criminal networks, and a strong presence of the state is required, together with economic opportunities, but our coasts lag in development to our inland provinces. This has a historical and cultural framework. Although Costa Rica has two beautiful oceans in very close proximity to each other, culturally, we have been a landlocked nation. We were settled primarily by Spaniards that settled in the Central Valley, surrounded by mountains, and land is what was valued. The oceans were simply where land ended. There's no value assigned to the ocean. And so our Heritage, our development uh, was all geared towards the inland of Costa Rica, the interior. And we left or turned our backs towards the oceans. What happens at sea would never be allowed on land. Now, Costa Rica is known as a, 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 a country that produces excellent coffee. Hope that you all continue to drink good Costa Rican coffee. But let's take the example as an analogy. Suppose you have this beautiful coffee farm in Costa Rica, and it's in a rich coffee growing region that produces the best quality coffee. And yet every day, illegal coffee pickers show up at the farm, and they jump the fence, and they just start picking coffee. And they take it home, they take you go away, there's no payment for this, there's no uh, record, and we start to lose our coffee crop. They're from all nationalities. Some are even subsidized to come from far away to illegally pick coffee. <clears throat> and then the uh, ox carts that take out the coffee from our coffee farms are underutilized. So now we see ox carts going through our coffee farm carrying fuel to refuel these faster 4x4 four four jeeps that are transporting cocaine. And the ox cart operator then takes his payment and sells drugs in the village. That is obviously a recipe for a disaster. But that is precisely what is happening in our oceans. And we would never allow that on land. So, the sad thing is that we probably lose, although this hasn't been quantified, but we probably lose the equivalent of the economic value of our entire coffee crop every year to illegal fishing with no income, no benefit for the country. And that has to stop. We need a greater presence at sea. And this means uh, better capabilities to monitor what is happening. Technology, which is uh, under discussion and under development, uh, certainly help in monitoring our exclusive economic zone. New equipment that will soon be delivered in Costa Rica uh, should also start to help, whether it's Coast Guard cutters that can go back and forth to Cocos Island several times and can really spend more time out at sea, helicopters, aircraft, 
radars, and we would like to also recognize uh, the generosity of uh, Foundation of donated a, a radar. Um, these will all start to help in having that greater presence in our oceans. We also need to feel a collective ownership of our oceans. Just like that coffee farmer feels that he or she owns that coffee farm and does not allow anyone to simply take the coffee. And this is cultural. But we have an opportunity, the emergence of our ecotourism industry, which is a relatively recent uh, economic activity, so it certainly help. It creates a lot of jobs in our coastal areas. And people should start to feel that protecting our oceans and sustainably using our oceans is certainly uh, in their best interest. We also must prepare and strengthen our judicial system so that offenders can be prosecuted. And our regulations should always be based on sound science. We should re remember that fisheries can be depleted even with legal fishing if the regulations are not based on sound science. And so we have to bring science into the equation in our regulations. And that's for both land and sea. <clears throat> Costa Rica has been incredibly progressive on land, in conservation matters, in uh, sustainability, in conserving our biodiversity. We are extremely biodiverse. This last year, we surveyed one hectare near one of our volcanoes. One hectare, that's 100 meters by 100 meters, just for flying insects. How many flying insects, different species, could we find on one hectare? We found over 11,000 on one hectare. And then two other sites found another 22,000, and the overlap was, uh, was less than 1%. So we have tremendous biodiversity that has been underestimated on land. That is probably also reflected in our oceans. We need to understand our biodiversity in our oceans. Well, now it's time to play catch up in our oceans with those progressive measures that we have to implement analogous progressive measures to conserve, to be creative on how we promote uh, the conservation of our oceans, and to create that blue economy as one of the engines of our development. Recent marine protected areas created in Costa Rica were announced are a strong sign that this administration wants to reverse that historical debt that we have in our ocean. We created recently the Aria Marina de Marejo Cabo Blanco. That's a reality. It's a new area. We are in the process of creating a new area, the Bahia Santa Elena, which will protect other habitats and other uh, areas that are very important for certain species. We have passed uh, port measures against IUU and recently uh, ratified the convention uh, to protect and develop sustainably marine zones in our Pacific coast. And all of this is incredibly relevant because fisheries count. And we don't have to look much further than this country to know how much fisheries count. I recently was given a book by uh, Rare called Cod. I would recommend it to you to everyone. It's a wonderful account of how Cod really affected world history and how Cod became strategic as, as a long-lasting food and protein source for voyagers that would go out at sea. And uh, you know, in the 19, in the 19, uh, 1400s, Cod fisheries in New England and Nova Scotia were very, very large. Not only was a lot of cod, but cod was very large. One example of a cod that was caught was 311 pounds. And the Basque and the Portuguese would come over, and there was a lot of trade between New England and Bilbao, Spain. And just 25 years after 
the arrival of the pilgrims. New England had moved beyond uh, uh, basically a, a, a startup settlement to starving settlers to have triangular commerce based on cod. They would trade cod with Spain. They also started trading cod with the West Indies and the Caribbean. That was a reject cod. It was used to feed the slaves down in the Caribbean. It was cheap protein. So the reject cod was sent down. And in the exchange from Spain, they would get iron, coal, fruit, wine. In the Caribbean would be molasses to produce rum. There would be um, uh, sugar, cotton, tobacco. And all of this based on cod. And it really allowed New Englanders to feel, start to feel independent of the crown. And back in a hundred years before the Declaration of Independence, 1677, a note was sent to the King of England, including that the laws of England did not reach America. And that, to a large extent, was based on cod because they felt independent. Well, the American Revolution was remarkably successful. It established a, a stable country, this experiment, uh, but it wasn't a revolution of, uh, along social lines, it was more economic. And it was, the, the real radicals of this revolution were Massachusetts merchants that had commercial interests. And out of that came the constitution of this country. So it's a it's a very interesting question to ask is what would have happened? What would the world look like today if the cod stocks of New England and Nova Scotia back in the fourteen hundreds had looked like today's cod stocks? There would have been different flows, different levels of independence, and it would have been a different world. Fisheries count. And what we're doing today is going to count for future generations. So I thank once again everyone for attending this event and for inviting me to, to participate in it. And uh, wish you all a very pleasant That was very inspiring and um, really, really point on to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, you heard us talk a little bit about the Codfather yesterday, which was a case in New England where they're trying to bring down those folks who were uh, um, unsustainably fishing uh, for cod. That's very few that still exist. So thank you. Wow. You know, um, I don't know if my sister has been living in Costa Rica for the last 30 years, and I've been blessed with it, being able to visit and see on the Atlantic coast those uh, amazing uh, resources, ocean and coastal resources that we have. And so, so thank you. <laughs>